I will talk about engineering design principles and then I will try to answer the question how much oil really gets into the cabin and we look at certification requirements a little bit. Then I want to give practical advice to pilots, uh, what can pilots do and then go on technical solutions. So we start at the very basics and uh, we've seen that here's the cabin at some normal pressure outside at cruise altitude we have low pressure so we want to ventilate the cabin and air has to come in here. Um, as there is low pressure we have to pressurize the air and when it's getting pressurized it's being heated up as you know when you pump the of your bike and so we need cooling. Then the air flows out at the end and we have an outflow valve that regulates the pressure. Um, here we see what happens. Here we have flight altitude and here we show temperature and pressure. As we go up uh, we have a pressure drop in the atmosphere also the temperature goes down. At 8000 feet usually according to requirements we say that's it and we maintain the pressure here. Um, outside the pressure goes down and the difference here we have to uh, compensate. That means due to uh, pressurizing the air as you know from your air pump for your bicycle uh, the temperature goes up and if we go to normal cruise altitude we would have something like 50 degree centigrade which is too much and therefore we need cooling. This uh, temperature line is the minimum we need but we will need more to drive the air conditioning system as I will show later. Um, here are the engines with the bleed air. The air is going into the cabin. It could also come from the APU. I can be a little bit quicker because um, you've learned already a couple of things. Um, here is the engine. Yet there are usually two valves, the intermediate pressure valve and the high pressure valve. Depending on engine RPM, the one or the other is used. We have the hot air and here it meets the pre-cooler. We want the pressure to um, have um, power available for the air conditioning packs, but the temperature is too high. So we have a pre-cooler here that kicks off some of uh, the temperature already and then in the so-called packs with the air cycle machine it's being cooled further then it goes into the cabin. Then we have recirculation. So this diagram that you've seen before is a little bit more complicated. Some of the air is taking off the cabin, it's being recirculated, it's going here into some mixer unit and there it's being brought back into the cabin. So what's the advantage? If we filter the air um, in the recirculation path with PAL HIPAA filters, um, then we have more fresh air that we can deliver to the passengers without the need to uh, pressure up air again and again which uh, needs energy. So how does it look like uh, in a real airplane? The air, the bleed air is coming here. We have the packs that do the second cooling and regulation of the required temperature. Um, the air is going into various cabin zones and the temperature of the cabin zones is controlled by trimmer valves that mix a little bit more hot air here and there um, depending on the need in the various uh, cabin zones. Then we have the recirculation. It goes through a filter. It doesn't do on its own. It needs a recirculation fan, which is this. So 50% of the air usually is being recirculated. Um, then 50% uh, goes out and we have the uh, new air coming in here. <coughs> so you've seen that picture before. We have the fan which is producing bypass air and air that goes um, through the engine core and here we have the compressor where um, the bleed air is being tapped off. The combustion chamber clearly comes after the compressor so therefore no um, and never it has been reported that combustion air is going into um, the bleed air. The compressor is theoretically providing clean air. It's a little bit different with smaller airplanes, um, with piston engines where there with the heat exchanger can be a mixture between combustion air and fresh air and they need the CO detectors although they are not even required. So here we have the engine and we see one of the bearings. In another uh, slide you've seen the several bearings and they may leak. So this is how bearings look like and uh, <laughs> when they leak oil we will hear more of that. Oil is dangerous and it's stated already on the can. What is being stated varies but we keep it here uh, as simple. It is 
dangerous. Now, how is the lubrication of the uh, bearings being done? Here is a reservoir and uh, oil is being pumped up to the bearings. Um, after it's being used, it goes back through a sump um, and goes back into the reservoir. Now we've heard that in order for the seals to seal, they need air. And air is mixing into the oil. Now, the air has to go out. Therefore, we have the deaerator. But it's an air-oil mixture. And if we would release the air-oil mixture the way it is, we would have an enormous oil consumption. Therefore, there is a separator that separates the air from the oil. But the separation cannot be 100%. Therefore, oil goes out together with the air. This is producing the oil consumption of the engine, pretty much. With a little exception, which is through the bleed air. You've seen that picture, only it's with a black background here. And I will go and address this a little bit more. So oil goes in here into the wet chamber or cavity, as it's called, to lubricate the bearing. The oil could leak out here through the labyrinth seal if not air would go the other way to prevent the oil leaking out. For kind of safety reasons, another wall is around so that as it is being depicted here, only air is going out, so it should be fully pure in the combustion section. But, oh, wait a minute, I have added something, and I say oil. Oil and air is leaking out. How can that be? How do I know? Because here it says drain, and I have added oil drain. So why do we need an oil drain on the so-called dry cavity? Yeah? Because there is oil in the so-called dry cavity. Because, as we've heard, it's not only air going in, but it's also, to a certain extent, oil and air, uh, air with oil mist going out. And here it is going into the drain. Therefore, if the air is leaking out, it is not just air, it is air and oil. And here we have it. Oil, no, seals leak oil by design. And I think here we fully understand why that's the case, and it's being admitted in that slide by Exxon, explaining that to us, um, only it's not really shown because I had, had, to, had to add that. So, various seals, the contacting one and the non-contacting one. We've heard that, an APU. An APU is a gas turbine, um, but the so-called bleed air from modern APUs is not being from the compressor of the gas turbine, it is from a load compressor. So people could think if it has a separate load compressor, then the air must be clean. But wait, here we have a diagram with more details. We have bearings here with labyrinth seals, like in the engine. The thing is a little bit smaller in magnitude because the APU is a smaller device. And you can say the larger the device is, the more power and forces you have, the larger the seals are, the hotter the whole thing is, the more complicated it gets. If you have a compressor on an engine, it is damn complicated. If you have a compressor on the APU, it's a little bit easier. If you have a compressor that is just compressing air and does nothing else, you can control leakage, you can even go with air bearings. Now, we have SAE, the Society of Air, Land and Sea, and it has a whole bunch of specifications. And together with GCAQE, uh, we looked at all kinds of uh, standards and picked out some. Here, for the air conditioning system, it says that the air cycle machine, this is what is called PEX, uh, should have at best air bearings so that we have, even in this device, no contamination. And it should have no external oil supply and external pressurization air source. Now we come to the engine. 
Sometimes we don't know who to blame. Is it the aircraft manufacturer or is it the engine manufacturer? Here it is being stated, requirements should be imposed on the engine manufacturer. And I think that's very clear, that this should be the way it is. And it says that the air should be free of engine-generated objectionable toxics, toxic materials, not contain the above substances uh, to any harmful degree. And if this cannot be met, we need bleed air cleaners. That's all there. Another um, document said all contamination can occur in using compressor bleed air from the main engines. I mean, these are documents for engineers to tell them how to design the machinery. And it says it may preclude its use for transport aircraft regardless of other reasons, like money. <laughs> yeah? You shouldn't do it. It's stated there, and it was stated there in 1991. And in 2011, the document went through a, re uh, a checking process, and the sentence stayed in, luckily. And then you have another document, until adequate toxicity data are available, precautions need to be met. And that means the industry has to prove that fluids and equipment are safe before they intend to use them. Not to build it and then see if someone dies and then say, oh, maybe we need to change something. So, now we get to the question, how much oil is getting into the cabin? And I take this system engineering view and make just boxes around. I don't care what is inside. I know this is an engine, oil and fuel is getting in, air is getting in, air and combustion products out. Here is bleed air, air is going out. And I start to calculate. <laughs> <coughs> when you see the online presentation in the appendix, you can look at the derivation. But to make, I won't even go through all that. I explain with the equation. You can see by looking at it that this equation makes sense. We take, <laughs> we take the air uh, that is going into an engine and we take the surface area of the engine as we see it and we multiply it with the Mach number and the speed of sound to get the velocity. So we have the volume flow of air coming in. We multiply it with the number of engines. Okay. Then mu is the bypass ratio because, as we've seen, only part of it goes through the core and it's of interest. Then we have the oil consumption. And Susan said half a liter power. And then we have bearings. And I say X bearing up is the proportion of bearings that are upstream of the tapping points because what is downstream doesn't affect the bleeder anymore. And then we have a, a parameter where I have a problem with. I call it X seal. This is the amount of oil that goes out the seal with respect to, oil, to all the oil being used up, the half a liter. I don't know that. I know that seals leak by design, but I don't know how much. Now I put in some numbers. Yeah? So we, we do not need to discount these numbers, but look at this. X seal is taken as 2%. 2% of the oil an engine consumes, I just assume, is going out the seals. 2%, not much. And we get a number. It is 10 microgram per cubic meter of oil, pyrolyzed oil, that we will find in the cabin. And we compared with the latest EASA study, and they said there is something, hydrocarbons in the air, even on the 787. This is some background noise. This is the furnishing that's evaporating something. But we see that all others are above. And how much are they above? 10. Now, OK, why is it 10? Because I fixed the 2% so that 10 comes out. Yeah, I admit that. But we have to start somewhere. <laughs> then I looked at the Cranfield study. And they measured a couple of things. Here it is. And I don't know what they did not me measure, but I added up what they measured. And here are the 10, and many go above. So I say the order of magnitude seems to be right. And we know that all kinds of things go out, uh, um, which is uh, the paralyzed oil. And he also said, and we have to be thankful that they do these studies, because if we sit at the desk, we don't find it out. 
Yeah, 127 compounds are in the pyrolyzed oil, and some of them are hazardous. He also said that in the study. Okay, now, health effect, occupational health and flight safety. When it's about long-term effects, occupational health, we have CS25 A31, Susan mentioned that. If we have immediate health effects, which is flight safety implications, we have 1309. So let's look at um, the first one, 831. It's about ventilation. Enable crew members to perform their duties without undue discomfort or fatigue, free from harmful or hazardous concentration of gases. So first I thought nothing, but well, that's not right. It's only free from harmful or hazardous concentrations. You can have low concentrations of nasty stuff. And then it goes on and as Susan said, it gives details. For example, on CO, 50 ppm. But now it comes to the interpretation and I get this from uh, the German air investigator in one of their reports from 2014. And it says that there is a debate between BFU and EASA. And EASA says, now wait a minute, it's only about CO and CO2. It's not about nasty stuff. It can have as much nasty stuff as you want. It's not in the regulation. <laughs> and BFU said, no, wait a minute, we read it a little bit differently. We read it such that health impairment should be eliminated. And BFU says further that neither crew nor passengers become chronically ill. This is their interpretation. But they also has a difference. They say, it's all okay. And if there is some dangerous stuff in it, maybe someone is affected. But we don't see that requirements tell us differently. Okay. Now we come to the other point which is the flight safety implication. And here we have 1309, and I knew that Susan will have this nice diagram that <coughs> if there is a, a um, major, uh, if there are large effects, then the probability has to be low. And there is this famous table. You have the effects on the airplane, and you have the probability. And so, if something extreme happens, if it's multiple fatalities, um, if it's a hull loss, the airplane crashes, everything is gone, then it's called a catastrophe, and here you see the probability. If things happen that are not so severe, it can happen with a um, higher probability. <laughs> but now we come to the details. EASA says it is impairment. Now here you see impairment, and that's hazardous, and it's 10 to the minus 7. But EASA says it is impairment, as we know it's major. Wait a minute, EASA, you have changed columns. It's wrong. So, EASA's classification is wrong, and what I have not put in, but I tell you anyhow, 1309 is meant that they are engineers, they do the best of the job they can, but still something can go wrong. Components break. And if that happens, then we have this table. And it ensures that if with the best engineering ever, something happens, we are this classification, we have to take some risk, but it is then acceptable. But if you use bleed air and you know that it is problematic, you cannot go 1309 and say, oh, fume events don't happen that often. It is not meant for that. It is meant for the failure you don't know. It is not meant for the failures you already know about. Yeah? So it's a, a distortion of the whole concept of engineering in aeronautical engineering. So now we come to hints for pilots and crew, and I also have to be a little critical maybe to the other side. <coughs> Let's start with CO. We see that CO levels even, and I was asking Susan, in the BA146 never reached more than 50 ppm. Um, also, I have to 
be a little bit critical with you, Tristan. The CO uh, needs to be measured in piston engines. Here, the combustion is behind compression, and I don't see the, the need to do so. But since the sensors coming up now, I have not included here, uh, for the toxic stuff, are pretty big, costly, only coming up. What you can do as a pilot is to take a CO detector, take the readings when you think everything is normal, in normal flight, and you see it's very low, maybe 1 ppm. And you do it every cruise flight, and 1 ppm, uh, 1.5 ppm, so you know what your level of CO is. Now you have a fume event. And we know from the pyr pyrolyzed oil study that um, pyrolyzed oil has CO. So you take the CO as indicative of something that happens. And you don't need to look at uh, the clouds of oil. You don't need to consider your nose and later being asked by management, what did your nose tell you today? <laughs> yeah, why did you abort the flight? You say here. This was my CO reading, and it was 10 ppm, well below limit, but normally it is one. And therefore, I made a decision to save the health of passengers. And another thing, all those who are concerned, I address more the cabin crew because the pilots have the oxygen mask, take this. I've been at the military, and they told me, if you have a situation with nerve gas, you put that on and you are safe. So if that's true, please buy this thing and carry it with you. <laughs> Another thing is, we are heard, if we are in such a situation as passengers, we cannot do anything, we cannot escape. That's true, but pilots can do something. They have direct venting. They take the air from the outside no engine, no APU. They have to go down to 10,000 feet on the A320, push that button and the ram air inlet goes on. But if you do that, you need to reduce your speed. And although you do this and you reduce your speed to the right um, true airspeed, to the right Mach number, as I have indicated here, you have most probably um, a problem with your range. But if you have sufficient fuel reserves, Please consider this as a pilot and, and save your passengers. Filtration with recirculation, as uh, Pal has introduced that already, um, is good, but it doesn't filter out everything. And here's an equation. If you have a normal recirculation uh, rate and filtration rate, um, you kick down the concentration from 100% coming in to 60%. Now, Tristan has praised the turbo compressor on the old airplanes. Um, let's see, is it a solution? Would it be a solution today? Here we have the problems of current airplanes and then we have the solution, exclamation mark, with the Boeing. So I was looking on the internet to see what the old folks who are still around had to say. And just read this, oil from the bearing case had leaked past the seals and run all over the fuselage. These things were not good. I am convinced that with today's technology, you could build them that they would really work well, but they had their problems in those days. So we should do something else. We should do the electrical um, ECS, and it works such that you have the engine with the generator. The generator is producing electricity, is running a motor. Here's the ECS, and here's the heat exchanger. Now, I said, um, <coughs> The, the air is heated up. Um, and you could say, just let the cold air from outside pass and you have cold air. Then you don't need any extra power. But um, you need to have it at lower temperatures and therefore you have a cooling mechanism and it takes energy. Now, one diagram and then we are done with the hef heavy stuff here. Um, we've seen that line. This is the uh, temperature going up. And it needs some power. When you heat air, it needs power. But the power that we uh, take off an engine uh, with bleed air is much higher because we need power, no, we need pressure to run the PECs. So we need pressure to run the PECs to cool the air. 
And to do so, we need to compress the air more. And if we compress the air more, it's even getting hotter. So here we have a difficulty. It works if we have a certain stand, uh, pressure here, uh, three bar, and we need lots of power. And the difference between the two is this, and it is something 150 kilowatts that we save if we uh, use the modern technology. Okay, I admit we need electricity, but when we take electricity from the engine, we get it at an amazing efficiency of 70%. 70% from a combustion process. So, what is Airbus doing? They know it all. They had studies, they have the electrical pack, they take the air from the outside in a research study. We're just waiting for the serious airplane to use it. Thanks.